Today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you this proof of concept that friends and I built years ago. Uh, we aren't going to do anything with this, so I'm going to open source the code and schematics here. And like all of my videos, I post to both Patreon and YouTube, but this will be a free video for my patrons. Thanks very much. So what is this? This is a off-the-shelf laboratory stir hot plate that I've outfitted with an RFID reader in the base and a temperature sensing RFID tag embedded in the stir bar. So if we put a different beaker on with another stir bar in there, it reads the new temperature of the liquid. This is warm water. And then we go back to room temperature water. It reads the tag and comes back down to 15. So this solves the problem of needing an external probe that hooks around and gets in your way. This is kind of the state of the art here. And normally what you have to do is unhook the probe and then put the probe down into the liquid like this. And as you can see, it's really quite janky and sort of a pain in the butt. And uh, more than just sort of an annoyance, <laughs> so you can see I'm kind of fiddling around with this, it is quite annoying. Um, if you're in the, in the lab and you actually have to take a beaker on and off quickly, saving just that little small amount of time is worth quite a lot because you have to go through it so many times. Also, if you're doing air sensitive chemistry, you might be working with a three neck flask like this and you might have a condenser hooked to here and inert gas hooked to here and um, addition funnel hooked to here. And now you're out of ports to put your temperature probe in at all. So being able to measure the temperature wirelessly saves you both time and, and makes you, your you know, ability to do uh, experiments much better. Once we've invested in putting some electronics into the stir bar, you of course can sense all kinds of other things other than temperature, you know, things like pH or ORP or turbidity or something like that. But even to something as basic as traction on the stir bar, we can sense. So if you speed up a stir plate, it stirs faster and faster until the bar launches off because we've lost traction, it can't spin that fast. And with our method, uh, the machine now knows that it's not in radio contact with the bar and you can program the machine to automatically slow back down and catch the bar again. And now that it's lined up again, it's reading out. So as we'll see, we're gonna do a teardown a little later and the read range and the concentricity of the coils together, the transmit coil and the tag coil uh, have to be pretty good. So by its, you could sense that it's lost traction with other sensors or magnetic you know, field sensors. You can see it's not hooked up anymore. But this is one way of just very quickly detecting whether the stir bar is still in, you know, magnetic contact with the motor. Another idea we had is that you could measure the uh, viscosity of the fluid by looking at like the magnetic slip angle. I think some stir plates might actually do this by looking at the torque put into the motor, but this would be a more accurate way of doing it. Uh, in the stir bar, you could put a Hall effect sensor to find the sort of magnetic slip angle to see how thick the fluid is. Since each tag has a serial number, you could also do some types of auditing or tracking in a lab. Like for example, the beaker could have a captive um, stir bar in the bottom. Like imagine like a glass cage in the bottom that keeps the stir bar as part of the beaker. Uh, that way the beaker would have a serial number and could record things like the number of thermal cycles it's been through or the maximum temperature that it's ever been exposed to, potentially how long it's been used in the lab if it writes like the date and time to the tag. Uh, there can be non-volatile memory in the stir bar itself, which opens up a whole bunch of other possibilities. And like I say, this is kind of a sort of free technology. Once you've already done the work of putting the board into the stir bar, you get all this other stuff, the serial number, the tracking, non-volatile storage, essentially for no additional hardware cost. So it gives you this platform to come up with all kinds of other features. Another idea is that you could use a very accurate pressure sensor inside the bar. Uh, these are cheap and in every cell phone now to measure the static head pressure to estimate how much liquid is in the beaker. And this could also be a nice safety feature so that if you forget about your experiment and the beaker goes to dryness, uh, it can tell the hot plate to shut off because you've run out of liquid. Also a quick note about intellectual property. Uh, there is quite a bit of prior art for this. Even eight or nine years ago when we were building this, uh, there was um, a, a pretty a uh, pretty key patent showing a, um, a laboratory hot plate stirrer with a temperature sensing bar. The technique they used was a surface acoustic wave filter, not an active RFID tag, so you wouldn't get some of these other features. But there's even more art that's not related to laboratory stir bars, just home cooking appliances, believe it or not, that use RFID tags in the vessel to measure the temperature of what it is, that you're, of what it is you're cooking. And by the way, this thing works the way you'd expect. You can um, turn the knob up and down and 
when you're adjusting the temperature, it shows you the set point. And if it's, the set point is higher than what it is, the heater comes on, it starts to bring the temperature up. And if you turn this down, uh, it flips back to the red temperature. And I basically hijacked the whole UI to this. So the display and the knobs go to my own microcontroller that's in here. And then that microcontroller decides whether to turn the heating element on or off. I was pretty proud of that. We'll do a little teardown and show how I basically um, took over the whole unit here. Uh, let's zoom in and take a look at the construction details of the bar itself. So here we're looking at our custom stir bar on the top here, molded in clear urethane, just so you can see the guts there. Uh, standard Teflon coated stir bar, and here's the circuit board that's inside there. So you can see that we're using a two chip solution. This is um, the, straight from the Texas Instruments development kit that we used. One chip does the radio frequency uh, rectification and power extraction from the RFID pulse. And then the other chip is just a standard MSP430 microcontroller. Um, very few other components. And interestingly, that is what we are using as the TAG's receive coil. It's just a standard off the shelf inductor. And the reason we had to do that is because a standard, this is low frequency by the way, 134 kilohertz RFID. Um, a standard 134 kilohertz RFID tag looks like this. And it doesn't work if a, the coil is oriented this way. Uh, we're, our read range has to be pretty good. Um, the coil in this base station below the ceramic top here is fairly far away just due to the physics of you know, how big your flask is. And if you've got a round bottom flask, you're not gonna get the bar really close to the thing here. And if the, if the coil is perpendicular to the transmit coil that's in the base, you don't get any reception. So it really has to be oriented this way. And now it's a little too big for a stir bar, even this giant one that we've over molded. It's gonna get really close to the edges and we knew we had to get this even smaller. Uh, one, of the, one of the requirements here is that the stir bar fits through the neck of one of these flasks and so you really can't get away with a huge receive coil. I also wanted a really cheap solution. So for example, sure, we could custom wind a coil or something in there, but that is a custom part. The benefit with this is that that's an off the shelf digikey part that we just plopped down. And a, it's a, about a two millihenry inductor. So there is some ferrite in the middle there. And I tested it both with and without shielding. Like it actually came with a little steel, uh, or not steel, maybe soft iron cage around it. And I ripped one off and it didn't seem to affect the read range all that much. One of the other benefits of doing this in a stir bar system like this is that the magnets actually enforce pretty good concentricity of the, of the coil in the base and the coil in the tag. You can see you can push this around, it just keeps pulling it back to the middle. And so that's great because now the coil in the tag is really guaranteed to be pretty well concentric with the, the transmitter in the base. Let's do a teardown of the base station so you can see what's going on in there. I know there's actually one interesting bit of history that you're not going to want to miss. Take a look at this. This is an Android developer kit in the form factor of an Arduino Mega. Um, it's funny, I actually must have had two of these because one of them had a six color silk screen to get the Google logo in the colors that you would expect. This one's actually just single color, so this must have been the cost reduced version or something. But <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, this is a stock circuit board that does the, the, the original hot plates work. I added this, which is a, a wall wart power supply to give me a low voltage for the microcontroller and electronics that I added. And this is the Texas Instruments development kit that connects to the uh, antenna or the coil and then sends the data back to the Arduino Mega. And this is what does the PID loop control and the interface, so the, the generation of the characters that are shown on the display, which come out and go through this. So originally uh, that uh, seven segment display was controlled by this board. There is some kind of some amount of logic out here. And I just unplugged it and plugged it into the Arduino and conveniently figured out what the signaling scheme is with these cables here. I even forget exactly what it is, but I guess it wasn't that hard to reverse engineer. And then the potentiometers for the set the things also go into the Arduino. So let's um, spin this thing around and you can see that the what's going on on this board the uh, base station coil is just these very fine wires that must be hard to see on camera, but we'll, we'll zoom in and take it apart. And it goes to a coil that's concentric with the spin axis of the motor. And for this prototype, I just used plain old magnet wire. But this is another interesting construction detail. You can't really get away with this. Even high temperature magnet wire is only good for 
I don't know, one or 200 degrees C, but the hot plate itself can easily get up to five or 600 degrees C. Um, we had a great solution for this though. There is another kind of um, wire that's ceramic coated. I guess you could call it magnet wire, but it's not coated with resin or a polymer. It's coated with a ceramic. So this can easily go up to five or 600 C and it's very thin so that you can sort of jam it under the heating elements and still get it close to the surface to get a good uh, signal from the, from the tag. So let's uh, keep taking it apart so you can see what's going on. If you've ever wondered how these things are built with the metal clips and everything, you'll, you'll see all the construction. So you can see here, uh, we've got obviously the heating element are these two, and then the coil that I added are these really fine magnet wires here. And this is a thermocouple so that the machine knows not to overheat the element. So the idea is that if you want to heat your you know, beaker of water up to 100, it just slams the heater on full, and eventually this will get up to a high enough temperature where you don't want to overheat the elements. So it needs to know the temperature of the elements just to uh, avoid overheating itself. I kind of like this construction detail. The, um, these stainless steel clips grab onto the porcelain top, the ceramic top, and just put some pressure on here to hold the heating element together. But really, it's just these clips that actually hold the entire machine together. There's no screws or positive fasteners that hold the ceramic on. And here it is, here's where all the magic happens. Um, this is hardly optimized. I basically copied the diameter and the inductance of the coil that came with the TI dev kit. So it's about 450 microhenries, something around 75 or 80 turns with a, I don't know, 30 millimeter diameter or something like that. And we have the option of putting it underneath the heating element, so directly below the ceramic plate or on top here. Now the trouble with putting it below is that uh, the surface of this heating element is made of mica and it's, it's very smooth. And so if you put the coil up on this side, one, it's going to be really hot up there, especially you know, even hotter because the heat might be in better contact with this thing. You might get a little bit of cooling if we put uh, this mica insulative layer there. But it also is just going to crunch this thing a little too hard. This actually sits pretty flush on the inside of the ceramic. So anyway, just for this proof of concept, I found out it worked fine just to put the coil on the bottom. And uh, I don't want to take apart the mica heater, but you can kind of see what's happening here. It looks like there's some uh, nickel ribbons or nichrome ribbons that go back and forth. And so the reed coil or the base station coil is able to work even through this presumably fairly dense, you know, set of, of metal bars there. Here's a closer look at the RF board. Uh, these two connections are where we go to the base station coil. And then there's a couple of jumpers here that allow you to change the tuning capacitance. So remember, this, wants to, this is a, a resonant circuit, and the coil is about 450 microhenries. And so you need about 3 nanofarads or something for it to resonate at about 134 kilohertz. Um, the, they, the manufacturers of this dev board know that you might want to try different coils, though. So you can switch in and out more or less capacitance using these jumpers. Um, like I say, I tuned it a little bit and realized that um, making the coil bigger doesn't just automatically increase your read range, you need more power too. And even TI says you might need an external amplifier if you want more, but I, I never found a great design guide explaining you know, read range, coil diameter, power in, and inductance very well. So I ended up just, for this proof of concept, being very happy that it worked with the stock diameter. And um, obviously if we're going to go into production, you'd need to optimize that a little bit better. So anyway, I hope you found that interesting. And if you have any questions about this, or I'll, I'll put the GitHub link to all the, the documents that I have left, with, which may not be very much. But anyway, I hope you found that interesting, and I will see you next time. Bye.